Hey everyone, it's Amr in Toronto right now. And it's Aaron, and welcome to another episode of Das Criminal Podcast. Yeah, we're, we're giving you, the audience, your weekly dose of political true crime. Woo, welcome back. So let's get into it? Yeah, let's not waste any time here. Cleopatra VII, perhaps best known mononymously as Cleopatra, is one of the most famous figures of popular culture. She is frequently painted as a seductress and an accessory to the Roman generals in her life, Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. She's one of the world's most ancient sex symbols. But we often neglect Cleopatra's legacy as a politician and commander in her own right. She was Egypt's last independent ruler and spent the latter part of her life unavailingly trying to keep her kingdom out of Rome's imperial clutches. As archaeologist Dwayne W. Roller explains in his biography of Cleopatra, quote, Like all women, she suffers from male-dominated historiography in both ancient and modern times, and was often seen merely as an appendage of the men in her life or was stereotyped into typical chauvinistic female roles such as seductress or sorceress, one whose primary accomplishment was ruining the men that she was involved with. End quote. If you haven't yet listened to last week's episode on Julius Caesar, we'd recommend it, though it isn't necessary in order to understand today's story. We do try our best to keep our content episodic, but if you are looking for a bit of background on Rome's expanding Mediterranean empire, it's a good place to start. Today, we want to explore the complex and often misunderstood story of Cleopatra and do our best to contextualize how views of gender have impacted narratives of her life while interrogating the strange brand of aristocratic boss-bitch feminism that arises around wealthy and powerful women. So with that, let's dive into the tale of one of ancient history's most famous Jezebels, Cleopatra. We'll start with her early life. Cleopatra VII Philopater was born in the year of 69 BC to King Ptolemy XII of Egypt. Her family's dynasty dates back to 330 BC, when Alexander the Great of Macedonia conquered Egypt. At that time, a Macedonian general named Ptolemy became the pharaoh of Egypt, starting the Ptolemaic dynasty. And as Erin just highlighted, the Ptolemaic dynasty traces its roots to Alexander's Macedonian general Ptolemy. But in effect, this means that Egypt was ruled by a non-Egyptian monarchy for as long as the Ptolemaic dynasty lasted, especially with the inbreeding that we're going to get into in a bit. Yeah, the Ptolemaic dynasty had ruled for centuries by the time our Cleopatra was born, but this wasn't actually that long in the context of ancient Egyptian civilization. To give you some perspective, the last of the pyramids of Giza were built around 2181 BC, which means that Cleopatra lived closer in time to us right now than she did to the construction of the pyramids, which is mind-blowing, honestly. Yeah, it also shows how long Egyptian civilization has been around. Right. As ancient as Cleopatra is to us, that's about how ancient the pyramids were to her. Yeah, that's incredible. So going into the Ptolemaic dynasty, we cannot emphasize enough how fucking weird Cleopatra's family was. First, the men are all named Ptolemy, and the women are all named either Cleopatra Berenike or Arsinoe. And this family tree is more like a family branch because as Amr alluded to, these people married their siblings, literally look up Cleopatra family tree, and it's just a straight line of people named Ptolemy and Cleopatra getting married and having kids, which they then uncreatively named Ptolemy and Cleopatra. So doing research for this episode was a little bit confusing because again, like everyone is named Ptolemy. Sibling marriage was a pharaonic tradition in ancient Egypt to keep the bloodline pure, which is ironic because, as we now know, the prevalence of incest, like sibling and cousin marriage in royal families, leads to a bunch of recessive maladies. Analyses of mummified remains show that these were a problem for ancient Egyptian nobility. And yet, somehow, the Habsburgs did not learn a single thing from the pharaohs. Also, uh, this inbreeding, as we talked about earlier, this means that Egypt was ruled by foreigners insofar as they were a Macedonian royal family with no blood ties to Egypt, in contrast to the earlier Egyptian civilizations in which the pharaohs were part of Egypt's population. 
Also, we don't know exactly who Cleopatra's mom was, but I bet my entire checking account that her name was either Cleopatra, Veronique, or Arsinoe. So in this family, people murder each other all the time. It's either kill or get killed. So Amr, you are lucky to be an only child. Okay, so just hypothetically, I feel like I would be able to outwit my hypothetical siblings and like succeed in becoming the heir to my parents' uh, estate or whatever. But I'm just, you know, hypothesizing here. I do think I am lucky um, only because I got all the toys to myself. But this also reminds me of the Ottoman Empire uh, where the sultan uh, would never have a designated heir. Instead, he'd have sons. And the expectation was that when the sultan died, all of his sons will each assemble separate armies and fight for the throne. And the logic was like this sort of weird Darwinistic um, assumption that only the strongest son deserves to inherit the throne. And so you had to prove your strength by like, you know, defeating and killing your siblings. Oh my, did they grow up together too? Oh no, they were, they, they were, they were sent to separate like, you know, areas to be raised. Oh, okay. Did you ever watch the Disney television program, Wizards of Waverly Place? Yeah. So do you know how they all train to have wizard powers, but for some reason only one of the children will get to keep them? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've always found that really disturbing. Uh, That's the implications what this reminds for that me are of. really disturbing, yeah. Disney shows, like if you actually dig into various Disney shows, there's a whole lot of trauma there. I couldn't imagine... My parents being like, work hard, Aaron, because when you grow up, you're going to have to murder your brother. (laughs) (laughs) So as you could imagine, Cleopatra's childhood is rife with interfamily conflict. In 58 BC, when Cleopatra was around 11 years old, her older sister, Varenike IV, stages a coup against their dad, Ptolemy, who flees the kingdom, and Cleopatra goes with him. In 55 BC, Ptolemy is restored as Egypt's pharaoh with the help of the Romans. At this point, Egypt is a client state of Rome. The Ptolemaic dynasty is heavily indebted to Roman creditors, while Rome depends on grain shipments from tributaries like Egypt to feed its population. So the emperor Ptolemy then has his daughter Varenike executed for trying to overthrow him. Talk about daddy issues. Ptolemy then names his two oldest children, excluding Varenike, obviously, because she's dead, as his successors, Ptolemy XIII and Cleopatra. So when their dad dies in 51 BC, Cleopatra is most likely forced to marry her brother and co-rule with him. The marriage is ceremonial because they never, like, had kids or anything, as we're about to discuss. At this point, Cleopatra is about 18 years old and Ptolemy is 10. So Cleopatra is like, no fucking way am I sharing power with this twerp, and pretty much immediately starts writing him out of the monarchy. Like, she only puts her own name on all the documents and stuff and pretends her brother doesn't exist. This remake of Modern Family has really gone down budget. (laughs) Ptolemy and his regents respond by expelling Cleopatra, who flees to Syria and begins raising her own army to dethrone her brother. And 2,000 years later, uh, the United Arab Republic experiment barely lasts two years before collapsing. So the lesson here is that Syrian-Egyptian unity is quite impossible, and Syrian-Egyptian conflict has a really long history. Meanwhile, as we discussed in our episode on Julius Caesar, a Roman general named Pompey Magnus is defeated by Caesar's army and flees to Egypt looking for refuge and military assistance in 48 BC. Boy King Ptolemy has Pompey beheaded, hoping that this will endear him to Julius Caesar. When Caesar arrives in Alexandria, chasing after his enemy, Ptolemy presents him with Pompey Magnus's severed head and says like, I've taken the liberty of decapitating your nemesis. Please lend me some soldiers to track down and kill my bitch-ass big sister, Cleopatra. Caesar doesn't take this well, and basically he tells Ptolemy to shove it. And in HBO's TV show Rome, Caesar is portrayed as having been emotional and sympathetic to Pompey in his death and reminiscing about the old friendship they had during the first triumvirate. Uh, But that being said, I wonder if his anger is purely political in that he's angry that these sort of foreigners would defile a Roman consul. 
Yeah, it's kind of hard to say exactly what Caesar was thinking there. We discuss his life and times, obviously, in depth in the episode we did on him. But what's pretty sure is that Ptolemy's guards imprisoned Caesar to pressure him into supplying those troops since he wouldn't do it on his own. Cleopatra, meanwhile, learns that Caesar is in Alexandria, and she sees an opportunity to reclaim power from her twerp brother. Basically, whichever sibling can convince Julius Caesar to lend his armies will win the power struggle over the other, and both of them know this. Cleopatra only had a small following, but Caesar's support could be transformative for her. Legend has it that on a warm Alexandrian night, Cleopatra had a single man row her across the harbor to the palace, hidden in a rolled-up carpet. The carpet was brought to the chambers of Julius Caesar, where Cleopatra unrolled herself and greeted the Roman general. Other accounts say that Cleopatra was hidden in a sack of linens, but the point of the story still stands. She snuck into the palace in some sort of rug or sack and then surprised Caesar. Ta-da! Okay, but I don't get this because... Like, if you're Ptolemy's guards and some random guy shows up with, like, a gigantic rug on his shoulder, like something out of Looney Tunes, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd be like, okay, here you go, pal. Yeah, Caesar definitely needs a new rug. I mean, she probably had some sort of insider in the palace, but if she just walked in, everyone would be like, that's Cleopatra. Yeah, that's true. I imagine there, there were, like, a lot of informants and insiders and so on. that make a lot more sense. Right. I know we refer to him in every other podcast episode, but when O.J. Simpson tried to steal his own memorabilia back, he like dressed up as a security guard and said, hey, I'm a security guard. And everyone was like, no, you're not. You're O.J. Simpson. (laughs) (laughs) So Cleopatra initially sent emissaries to meet with Caesar on her behalf and ask for his support. But then she learned that he had somewhat of a reputation for being a womanizer and forming romantic relationships with powerful women. So Cleopatra thinks about this, and she's like, hmm, I check all of his boxes. She had royal blood as a pharaoh and a descendant of one of Alexander the Great's generals. Even though Rome at this time rejected the idea of an absolute monarchy, aristocratic bloodlines like those of the patrician class were still highly valued. She spoke several languages fluently, including the local Egyptian, which was actually really rare for the Ptolemaic rulers who normally held court in their own Hellenic Greek. She likely spoke Persian and Aramaic as well. And from what I understand, uh, based on my cursory reading, um, she was actually widely popular among the Egyptian masses. This was particularly true because Ptolemy, along with his advisors, were levying heavy taxes on the local population. Uh, which caused unrest and support for Cleopatra to grow. Yeah, it sounds like she was pretty popular with the Egyptian people in terms of a pharaoh of that time. Within the context of being a tyrant, I feel like the people preferred her to Ptolemy. Right, benevolent dictator situation for sure. Yeah, exactly. She was extremely well-educated and could hold her own in conversations about politics, literature, and philosophy. One of the more contentious aspects of Cleopatra's biography is what she actually looked like. Other than some ancient coins, we don't really have any representations of her that were made during her lifetime. She was probably pretty small if she could fit into a rolled-up carpet or a linen sack, and from the looks of the coins with her face, she probably had a prominent nose and chin, which were known to be Ptolemaic family traits. I personally picture her to look like the Spanish Romani actress Alba Flores, if you know who that is, Amr. I did look her up, um, and now the image is ingrained in my head, but I didn't hear about her before. I think she's really beautiful, and she also has a prominent nose. Uh, Just in case you want to put a visual to it, but this is completely my imagination. (laughs) So Roman propaganda about Cleopatra says that she was so beautiful, men couldn't control themselves around her. This was, and still is, a way for men to excuse their actions. Which makes me wonder, was Valerie Solanus right when she said men are the ones driven by emotion rather than rationality? Dun dun. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be very interested to see if Valerie Solanus could last a day in ancient Egypt. I just picture her, like, angrily writing on a scroll of papyrus. Or, like, taking a spear and chasing Julius Caesar. Definitely her her attitude. Yeah, definitely a go-getter. I'll give her that. According to biographer Dwayne W. Roller, quote, 
A notice by Plutarch is often misquoted to imply that Cleopatra was not particularly beautiful. But what was actually written is that the force of her personality far outweighed any physical attractiveness. Sources agree that her charm was outstanding and her presence remarkable. End quote. From the sounds of it, she was good looking, but it was her personality that was really enchanting. She was just extremely charismatic, and people just genuinely liked being around her. I've only met a few people in my life who have such a magnetic personality like that. But from the sounds of it, Cleopatra was definitely one of those people. There could be a hundred people in a room and she could make you feel like you were the only thing she cared about in the universe. I don't know if you've ever met anyone like that, Amr. Oh, I've I've met people like that. And it's really, it's really unique. It's a very rare thing. Right. And at least in my experience, someone who is fun to be around slowly begins to appear more physically attractive, whereas someone who sucks all the fun out of the room becomes less attractive. Like I've definitely been in situations where I thought someone was really good looking and then they said something totally obnoxious or insensitive and that feeling of attraction for me, like it just immediately flushed away. Um, I've been in that situation as well, except I do have a couple of problematic faves that I've told you privately. Yeah, yeah, but... I feel like, too, this is a connection in real life. Like, someone who is charismatic like that, you can read it on television and such, but in person, some people are just really enchanting to be around. I don't know exactly how to put it into words, but I feel like if you know what I'm talking about, then you know. They make you feel seen, like capital S. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, this is all speculation, and it's literally ancient history, but... I just have a feeling Cleopatra had one of those alluring personalities where people want to have her attention and be around her. So Cleopatra is able to convince Julius Caesar to take her side in her power struggle against her brother Ptolemy in an alliance that will benefit both of them. Cleopatra will regain control of Egypt, and Caesar will have a reliable proxy in Rome's client state, which is conducive to Rome's economy. At first, Caesar does try to force Cleopatra and Ptolemy to get along, but Ptolemy's advisors start the Alexandrian War in 47 BC. After some sieges and skirmishes, Cleopatra, with Caesar's assistance, is victorious against her brother Ptolemy. Ptolemy drowns in the Nile while trying to flee. The Nile is actually loaded with hippos and crocodiles and is a very dangerous river to try and swim in. Um, people say drown, but I do suspect foul play because, as you said, Erin, earlier, uh, this family seems to have a long history of fratricide. Yeah, and also, he was fleeing Alexandria, like, fleeing Cleopatra's soldiers when he drowned, allegedly. So, even if he did drown, he wouldn't have, you know, (laughs) if he had been, like, sitting in the city. Poor kid. Cleopatra's little sister, Arsinoe, had taken Ptolemy's side and was taken back to Rome and spent the remainder of her life at a temple there. Drunk History by Comedy Central does a story about this with Lyric Lewis that is actually pretty entertaining. We'll make sure to put it in the sources. Caesar installs Cleopatra as the ruler of Egypt with her other brother, whose name is also Ptolemy, because what the fuck is wrong with this family? But he's a child and a ruler in name only. Cleopatra now has the reins of the kingdom. Caesar and Cleopatra also take a victory cruise down the Nile River and gaze upon the splendor of Egypt's natural resources. During this time, famously, Julius Caesar and Cleopatra had also begun an affair. At this point, Caesar is around 53 years old and Cleopatra is about 22. Now, the reasons for this romantic entanglement are cause for historical debate. Was seducing Julius Caesar part of Cleopatra's plan to convince him to lend his armies to her in her struggle against Ptolemy? Or did the romance develop once they started to get to know each other? Did Caesar and Cleopatra see their affair as a fling, or did they consider trying to jointly rule Egypt and Rome? And how much of their relationship was born from political efficacy versus genuine love? I don't think we're ever going to really know, but it's just some things for you to think about. Also, I think modern conceptions of, quote, genuine love, end quote, might not exactly match what people in different societies in the past and in different places in the world consider genuine love, if that makes sense. 
No, it totally does. And different parts of the world, for instance, where marriages arranged by parents or families are more common, don't necessarily report more love or less love within those marriages. Like it can yeah. be really complicated what draws you to someone and makes you decide to spend your life with them. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, um, I don't know if we're allowed to get into personal details on this podcast, but like my parents had an arranged marriage. And while they've had conflict between each other, I found it fascinating because right now, like for the most part of their marriage, they it's almost like they're roommates, like the roommates that live together. Like, like it's weird. Like if I ask them, do you love each other? They'll say yes. But what they consider love is not what someone like myself or you would consider love for them. It's just like a sort of like, yeah, you know, we're, we're amicable. We're happy together. We had you as our child um, and we did our duty, you know, to society and to our families. Uh, but they wouldn't say they like, they wouldn't report less love either, which is what you pointed, which is interesting to me. It's fascinating. Yeah. I also, I think that's really interesting. And while I would not want to be in that situation, I don't think it's fair for me to like dictate how other people feel about their partner. You know, like that's such yeah. a personal and cultural thing. Cleopatra became pregnant with Caesar's child and soon after he left Egypt, gave birth to a son whom she named Ptolemy the 15th Caesar or Caesarion, meaning little Caesar. Cleopatra, her brother Ptolemy and her son Caesarion go to Rome. The baby is explosive for Rome because he represents a male heir to Julius Caesar. The Roman Senate in particular is not fond of the idea of Julius Caesar considering monarchy through his son. Caesar and Cleopatra could be a powerful alliance, more powerful than the slow-moving Roman Senate. Cleopatra tries to make allies in Rome, but most of the Romans resented her. They saw her as Caesar's foreign mistress and a threat to the Roman Republic. Still, Caesar set up a villa for Cleopatra right near his own and erected a statue of her in the Forum, indicating that he probably did have some feelings for her. I just can't stop imagining right now a sort of Roman The View with like a Roman Meghan McCain absolutely losing her shit because Cleopatra is in town. <laughs> yeah, she, she did cause quite a stir, it sounds like. Yeah, I... I, I I didn't realize Romans were this xenophobic, especially considering how multicultural, for lack of a better word, the empire was at the time, or the Republic, rather. I think, too, from the Julius Caesar episode and from this one, the Roman patrician aristocracy was very petty. And, like, they all knew each other, they all banged each other, banged each other's wives, like, a very dramatic place. That makes sense. Yeah, I can imagine that the, despite the multiculturalism on the surface, the elites are actually very insular. Right. And why did William Shakespeare choose ancient Rome as the setting for his plays? He was like, this is loaded with content. This is a content mine. Well, that's what people used to do before Twitter was invented, just bang each other's wives. <laughs> In 44 BC, a conspiracy of Roman senators assassinate Julius Caesar and Cleopatra returns to Alexandria. Soon after, Cleopatra's brother and co-ruler in name Ptolemy XIV is killed. Most sources believe that Cleopatra orchestrated his murder, likely poisoning him with aconite, also known as wolfsbane, so that she could declare her own son Caesarion as co-ruler. And here I'd like to go on a tangent, if you will, because the, the years following Caesar's assassination are quite fascinating in Roman history. So immediately following Caesar's assassination, Mark Antony had briefly secured political power before being forced out by the Senate um, and instructed to govern Macedonia, which is like really far away from Rome, which is what the Senate were intending. They just wanted to get rid of him as far away as possible. Um, understandably, Mark Antony was really pissed uh, because he just wanted to stay closer to Rome and, you know, build his political base. So he asked for the governorship of Cisalpine Gaul, which is the side of uh, the Alps that is uh, the Italian side, modern day Italian side. Um, but unfortunately, the Senate had already bestowed that position to Decimus Brutus, uh, one of the assassins of Caesar. So Mark Anthony, being the go-getter that he is, assembled his legions and marched on Decimus Brutus. 
eventually encircling him in a town called Mutina in Cisalpine Gaul. Um, the Senate declares Mark Antony a public enemy and organizes an army to fight him. And here's where things get really interesting. Octavian, Caesar's nephew and adopted son and heir, pledges his allegiance to the Senate and marches against Mark Anthony. This first post-Caesar civil war really shows Octavian's political acumen and how he takes advantage of opportunities as they rise. So the Senate assigns an Aulus Heritus, one of the consuls of that year, to lead the army. However, Aulus is killed during battle, leaving Octavian in charge of the army. Octavian defeats Mark Antony, uh, but the victory is not really comprehensive because Mark Antony manages to retreat in good order and regroup with fresh legions brought by by another Caesarian uh, lieutenant, Clepidus. When news reaches Octavian that the second consul in Rome, uh, Gaius Pansa, had died, ostensibly due to wounds taken during battle, Octavian takes his army and defies Decimus Brutus, who was basically trying to get Octavian to go after Mark Anthony and, you know, kill him. Instead, Octavian takes his army and marches on Rome, uh, forcing out the Republican Senate. Isolated and alone, Decimus Brutus flees to Macedonia, where Celtic warriors, uh, hired by Mark Anthony, kill him. Your people seem to be very uh, multi-talented, Eren. Oh, the Celts were everywhere, yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, Octavian, having earlier fought Mark Antony, now signs a pact with him and Lepidus, officially forming the second triumvirate. If you remember from our Julius Caesar episode, the first triumvirate was composed of Crassus, Caesar, and Pompey. Now it's Octavian, Mark Antony, and Lepidus. At the same time, Caesar's principal assassins, Marcus Junius Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus, had fled to the east and now controlled the eastern Roman provinces from Macedonia all the way down to Syria, and had a considerable army of their own. The second triumvirate decides to crush the Republicans and avenge Caesar. They leave Lepidus in town to govern Rome, while Octavian and Mark Antony march with 28 legions to Macedonia. There, they're confronted by 17 legions of Cassius and Brutus. And on the fields of Philippi in Macedonia the Roman Republic finally meets its end. The triumvirs achieve total victory. Cassius and Brutus commit suicide to avoid capture, which is a common thing at the time. And with Caesar avenged, Octavian and Mark Antony now turn their knives towards each other because each of them sees himself as the sole future ruler of Rome. And there is only one spot for the alpha lion, if you will. How many times do the Romans have to go through this before they learn their lesson? (laughs) Back in Rome, a power vacuum opens up in the wake of Caesar's assassination, as Amr just explained. Mark Antony is a powerful and respected general with plenty of military victories under his belt, but Octavian is a shrewd politician, something that Mark Antony characteristically lacks. Mark Antony and Octavian essentially divide up control of the Roman Empire, with Mark Antony controlling the East and Octavian controlling the West. But this is a temporary solution to their problem, as both of them hope to ultimately control the entire empire. And Lepidus, our dear friend, uh, being the sort of junior member of the triumvirate, uh, was basically bullied um, and shafted by getting North Africa, which in the Roman uh, Republic and Roman Empire terms, is relatively less wealthy than the other two regions in terms of both population, uh, fertile lands, and general resources. Yeah, Lepidus is basically the Hades of the group who gets shoved to the underworld while the other two rule the land and sea. That's actually a really good example. That's actually a fucking good example, yeah. Thank you. (laughs) I feel bad for Hades now. Mark Antony determines that if he's going to win the hearts and minds of the Roman people, he's got to do something impressive. So he decides to conquer Parthia. Parthia is the Persian-Iranian empire to the east of Rome and the Mediterranean. If you listened to our last episode, you already know that conquering Parthia is a very ambitious goal. Crassus tried to conquer them and they poured molten gold down his throat. Caesar resolved to conquer them and he got stabbed 23 times before he even left Rome. Parthia hasn't actually been conquered by outsiders since Alexander the Great's conquests. 
Mark Antony knows if he's going to have any chance at winning a war with Parthia, he's going to need troops and supplies. So he turns to his late mentor Julius Caesar's old ally in the east, Cleopatra. In 41 BC, Mark Antony summons Cleopatra to Tarsus in modern-day southern Turkey to request her assistance in his invasion of Parthia. Cleopatra wants to impress Mark Antony with her wealth and the wealth of Egypt, so she dresses herself up like the Greek goddess of love, Aphrodite, and rides into Tarsus on a barge with gold all around her and enslaved people dressed as Cupid fanning her in this massive display of fortune. Mark Antony and Cleopatra enjoy a lavish banquet with lights sparkling all around them. Cleopatra really wants to wow him. This begs the question, was Cleopatra out to seduce Mark Antony from the very beginning? Did she want to secure another political ally as a romantic partner as well? I I think that would be a really smart move because at this time, Mark Antony was basically experiencing the highest point of his life as a Roman general. Um, he just defeated the Republicans at Philippi. He secured half the Roman Empire for himself. And you really can't get any bigger fish than him if you're a Cleopatra. I mean, Mark Antony in this period of his life is basically the Barcelona football team from 2009 to 2012, or uh, LeBron James in the mid-2010s. Basically just like, you know, the prime of his career. Cleopatra agrees to supply Mark Antony with money and troops for his invasion of Parthia in exchange for him executing her sister Arsinoe back in Rome. Cleopatra now has no siblings left to rival her power, as Varenike was killed by their father, one Ptolemy drowned in the Nile running away from her, the other Ptolemy was mysteriously poisoned, probably by her, and Arsinoe was tracked down and killed by Mark Antony's soldiers in Rome. Fratricide is bad, and we definitely don't endorse it, but it also wasn't unheard of at that time for royalty to kill off everyone who threatened their place on the throne, including siblings. Again, you either kill or get killed. Yeah, and think of that the next time you get into a fight with a sibling and tell them you hate them forever. Not sharing their PlayStation with you is certainly a much better outcome than, you know, um, your sibling throwing you in the Nile or assassinating you. Yeah, I would concur. Cleopatra and Mark Antony went back to Alexandria and had all sorts of fun drinking, partying, and living a lavish lifestyle on the backs of the Egyptian peasants. They even formed a drinking club called the Inimitable Livers, which is a 10 out of 10 name, to be honest. Yeah, I'm, I'm stealing that name definitely for like a group chat or a band or something. I think they mean livers here as in people who are alive, not as in the internal organ. But the double entendre in English, especially 2000 years later, is just chef's kiss. Yeah, I'm definitely like, yeah, that's, that's going to be my theme. My next birthday theme is going to be this. But perhaps Cleopatra was a little too charming this time, because Mark Antony had so much fun paling around in Egypt that he pretty much lost interest in conquering Parthia. Cleopatra also became pregnant again and gave birth to twins, named Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene II. So there are some rumors that uh, they had way too much fun and that uh, they smoked a lot of opium. Egypt in ancient Greek mythology was known as the land of the lotus eaters because of the opium habits. So Mark Anthony just found it way too comfortable in Alexandria at this point. Mark Antony has to go back to Rome and deal with some political stuff. And when he does, this scoundrel ends up marrying Octavian's younger sister, Octavia, and moving to Athens with her where they have two daughters. Meanwhile, Cleopatra is just governing Egypt, like working on taxes and trade and stuff like that. Okay, to be fair, though, if I was going to break up with someone, saying that I need to go to Rome and deal with some political stuff is probably my, my way of breaking up with them. Listen, honey, l look, the Senate's asking for me. Octavia needs a second consul. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll see you in the next couple of years. Bye. I think it's really mean. Could you imagine hearing that he married his nemesis's sister? Yeah, but then again, Romans are very incestuous peoples, apparently. In 37 BC, Mark Antony decides once again that he should try to conquer Parthia, and he calls for Cleopatra to meet him at Antioch. Cleopatra comes and brings the couple's twins, and she's like, um, 
you kind of ditched me and went back to Rome and married a Roman woman. Why should I help you? Also, I don't think you're even taking this invasion seriously because last time you said you wanted to invade Parthia, you just sat in Alexandria drinking wine and eating figs. Respect, man. Respect. I have to respect that right there. That is something yeah, I would she do. she was pissed. But that's something I would do. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely going to do this project. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, just sit at home and watch Netflix. <laughs> but as we already know, Cleopatra is a politically savvy woman. So she decides not to tell Mark Antony to fuck off back to Rome, which is what I would have done. But instead, she demands a large chunk of Roman Empire in exchange for her help invading Parthia. Mark Antony agrees, and Cleopatra receives territory in Syria, Cyprus, and Judea Palestine. Egypt is no longer a client state of Rome. Cleopatra is on the way to building her own empire. Mark Antony and Cleopatra celebrate their desire for joint rule over the East by minting coins with their faces on them, which is not subtle. Mark Antony and Cleopatra spend six months together in Syria, planning the Parthia campaign. In 36 BC, the Parthian expedition sets forth, and Mark Antony and Cleopatra go together for a while before Cleopatra sets off on a tour of Egypt's new territory. She also gives birth to her fourth child, Ptolemy Philadelphos. Please, Cleopatra, pick a new name. Stop naming your kids Ptolemy. Well, she named. She didn't name one of them Ptolemy, the Alexander, the, one of the twins, Alexander. That's Ilias. true. There's one non-Ptolemy. Rumors circulate back in Rome that Mark Antony and Cleopatra have married, and the Romans don't like it that Antony is cheating on his wife, Octavia. Octavian is an incredibly organized politician and exploits these rumors for his own gain, painting Mark Antony as an adulterer, which, I mean, he was, but lots of Roman soldiers and politicians were, to be fair. But also to be fair, Octavian sees an opportunity and exploits Rome's latent xenophobia. Mark Antony wasn't just an adulterer and he wasn't just cheating on his wife. He was cheating on her with a foreign woman. Ooh, a barbarian. Ooh, an Egyptian who doesn't even worship those Roman gods. She probably does voodoo. Ooh. And you know, the Romans pissed themselves basically. Uh, but you see this rhetoric even today. I used to watch a lot of uh, Khaliji TV shows like from the Gulf. And one of those shows, like all of those shows have very common base stories. And there's always a side plot where this father who's like, you know, married to a Khaliji wife and they have kids and a house and so on. He'll end up marrying a second, younger, sort of more attractive, uh, but also smarter wife who's like Moroccan or Lebanese usually. And that like second wife, it's always, she's always portrayed as a sort of like, cunning sort of in a negative way so to speak like a jezebel who then conspires to like steal the inheritance of the kids and the first wife and take the estate in the company and you know like shafts the kindly old first wife right it's kind of the evil stepmother trope but there's racism laced into it pretty much yeah the invasion of parthia is a complete disaster and mark antony is forced to retreat to the safety of alexandria with cleopatra this makes him look weak compared to his rival Octavian, and perhaps suggests that without Julius Caesar calling the shots, Mark Antony maybe isn't the best conqueror. Meanwhile, Octavia goes to meet her husband, Mark Antony, in Alexandria, which forces him to make a choice between her and Cleopatra. Cleopatra may have come around again to Mark Antony after he started another family behind her back, but she definitely wasn't going to go through the indignity of him bringing that family to her kingdom. Amr, did anyone in your like extended family or anyone you know ever have a secret second family? Uh, not that I know of. I mean, I know several extended family members who are like cheating on their wives, but not like to the extent of having a second family. Um, I know one, one of my uncles in law married my aunt. Uh, and she, my aunt being his second wife, but it was like not secret, like his first wife knew he was marrying a second wife. And he goes back and forth between the two and he has kids with both. It's really fucking weird. Yeah, someone in my extended family did have a secret second family. And I think they found out when he died. Wow. Yeah, like his wife, you know, went to make funeral arrangements and then his other wife showed up and was like, this is my husband. And she was like, what? This is my husband. 
The only, the only fair outcome there is to cut his body in half and have each family do their own funeral with half a body. Right. That's what Solomon wants. Yeah, basically. I'm like the King Solomon of modern day troubles. <laughs> That's what you get. Yeah. Well, also you, also, you also find out which of his wives liked him more by the wife that says, no, no, we don't have to cut his body in half. <laughs> I think at that point, I'd be like, sure, you can pay for this funeral. Goodbye. <laughs> so Mark Antony, forced to choose between Octavia and Cleopatra, rejects Octavia, not even agreeing to speak to her. She returns to Rome, humiliated, and her brother Octavian is pissed. He tells everyone that Mark Antony has finally shown his true colors. He prefers Egypt over Rome. An intense propaganda war begins between Mark Antony and Octavian. In 34 BC, Antony and Cleopatra capture Armenia, which is a military victory for them. They celebrate back in Alexandria by holding a ceremony, establishing their own children as the future leaders of an Egyptian Roman dynasty. Obviously, Octavian is outraged once again and tells the Roman public that Mark Antony is a degenerate alcoholic living large with Cleopatra while turning his back on Rome. Octavian also plays on Rome's fear of monarchies by pointing out that Mark Antony and Cleopatra plan on imposing a foreign royal family on Rome and abolishing the Senate, uh, which is, you know, notwithstanding the fact that he wanted to do the exact same thing. Yeah, I think it's interesting, too, that a lot of sources say Octavian was engaging in this harsh propaganda campaign saying that Mark Antony was favoring Egypt and trying to raise a dynasty with Cleopatra. But Mark Antony and Cleopatra, like, minted coins with their faces on them. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like, Mark Antony w was in Egypt and he was having kids with Cleopatra. So, like, nothing he was saying was particularly fake or false. Right. Mark Antony does respond by saying that the allegations are untrue, and he sends rather crude letters back to Octavian, mocking him and calling him a hypocrite, but I, it sounds like Octavian is making some points. Octavian then comes up with the nail in the coffin for Mark Antony. He claims that the Vestal Virgins have given him Mark Antony's will, and that the will states that after he dies, Mark Antony would like to be buried in Egypt with Cleopatra. Historians believe the will was most likely a forgery. But the Roman public is furious. They believe Mark Antony has totally sold out and doesn't even want to be Roman anymore. If you don't like Rome, leave it. Turning point Rome. Of, of course, during this time, uh, Lepidus, uh, the, the Hades of the group, was still sort of kicking around. And a revolt in Sicily led by Sextus Pompey who was a descendant of Pompey Magnus. I think he was his grandchild or great-grandchild. I'm not sure of the particular generation, but uh, he leads a revolt in Sicily, and uh, the Senate and the Triumvirate uh, basically send Lepidus to crush it. And Lepidus succeeds, but he overstretches his hand by trying to claim Sicily for himself. And Octavian uses that as an excuse to accuse him of fomenting revolt himself and treason and removes him from all of his political offices except for Pontifex Maximus, basically defanging him and leaving him completely politically powerless. Damn, Sicily gate. Yeah. In 32 BC, Octavian declares war on Cleopatra, forcing Mark Antony to either return to Rome as a general and fight against the Queen of Egypt, or battle Octavian alongside his lover, Cleopatra. He remains loyal to Cleopatra, and they summoned the support of allied kings in the area. The navies of Mark Antony and Octavian engage at Actium, off the coast of Greece. Octavian is successful in battle, and Mark Antony and Cleopatra flee, cutting through the fleet and sailing back to Alexandria and their boats and treasure. And the Battle of Actium, in which Octavian has defeated the combined forces of Mark Antony and Cleopatra at sea, is a very remarkable event, uh, because for one, command of Octavian's forces was given to his foremost lieutenant and close friend, Marcus Vespanius Agrippa. In fact, even though Octavian was a political genius, his actual military prowess was rather unremarkable, and his military successes were primarily the result of his friend Agrippa's hard work, but it also shows how cunning Octavian is 
to know when to delegate tasks to more appropriate personnel, so to speak. Yeah, I watched a documentary in preparation for this episode called The Real Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And they pretty much portray Octavian as he's he doesn't have the stature of a general that Mark Antony has. Their masculinities are pinned up against each other, which is very interesting in the context of Mark Antony running away to Egypt to be with Cleopatra. Yeah, but also like from a political perspective, I don't know, like just looking back at our last episode when Caesar goes to Egypt and leaves uh, or goes chasing Pompey and leaves Mark Antony in control of Rome and like riots happen and Mark Antony has no idea how to govern. It doesn't seem like Mark Antony was a particularly good politician or leader. Oh, to me, he does not seem like the brightest bulb on the chandelier. He sounds like a jock, like an ancient equivalent of a jock. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Battle of Actium has been a defeat. Mark Antony and Cleopatra try to install Caesarion as Egypt's pharaoh and exile themselves, but this plan is thwarted by Octavian's proxies in the area. They also try to negotiate a deal with Octavian, but this goes nowhere. And they understand it's only a matter of time until Octavian comes to Egypt to finish them off. I originally thought that once Mark Antony and Cleopatra were defeated in battle, they died pretty much right away. But this isn't the case. For about a year, they stayed in Alexandria, drinking, partying, and waiting for their inevitable demise. They even renamed the inimitable livers the Partners in Death, which is some really fucking dark stuff. That's like when a band goes from alternative rock to, like, dark metal. In 30 BC, Octavian invades Egypt, and after a series of unsuccessful battles against him, Mark Antony and Cleopatra accept their fate. Cleopatra retreats to her mausoleum, surrounded by all her riches. In a very Romeo and Juliet kind of way, Mark Antony gets word that Cleopatra has died and resolves to kill himself by stabbing himself with his sword. But in true Mark Antony fashion, he gums it up and misses most of his vital organs. So now he's bleeding out while Egypt falls to Octavian. He's also ruining the carpet. The carpet that, uh, you know, like, come on, man. Mark Antony is brought to Cleopatra. And while he's dying, she was very upset, holding him as he passed away. Oh, she loved him. That's nice. That's cute. It sounds like she really did, honestly. Yeah, that's nice. Cleopatra did not want to be captured and paraded through Rome as a concubine. So according to classical lore, Cleopatra had a venomous snake brought to her, concealed in a basket of figs. In a defiant last act, she lifted the snake, the protector of the pharaohs, to her skin, and it bit her, marking the end of Egyptian independence as the kingdom fell to Rome. Historians now believe it's more likely that Cleopatra poisoned herself using the tip of something sharp like a hairpin, or some other method of suicide. The image of Cleopatra killing herself with a snake really freaked out the Romans. They had always found Cleopatra kind of scary. Caesarion rules Egypt in name for about two weeks before Octavian has him killed. Man, even children can't escape Octavian's ambition. Yeah, and Caesarion was his cousin. Yeah, fuck, yeah. Egypt's wealth and resources kickstarts the regime and Octavian's empire. Cleopatra and Mark Antony were buried together, but their tomb has never been found. So we've got like a little bit of an analysis of the historiography here. I think that the fucked her way to the top image of Cleopatra is definitely based in sexism, and the same kind of sexism still exists today. Women at the top of their fields, especially if they're conventionally attractive, are accused of using sex appeal to get there. And it's obviously sexist as it assumes that women are incapable of succeeding due to skill and determination. But at the same time, and please do not come for me, internet, I feel like contemporary feminist biographies of Cleopatra focus way too much on trying to disprove the seductress model that they fall right into the trap of the Madonna whore complex. Because, like, so what if Cleopatra did seduce Julius Caesar and Mark Antony to get her way? So what if Rome's greatest generals were led around by their dicks? You're telling me that these buffoons were able to conquer Gaul, but lost their minds around an attractive woman? 
Isn't that their problem? Women can be smart and sexy at the same time, and it's other people's responsibility not to drool over us or, God forbid, abandon their republic to conquer Parthia with us. How about conquer Parthia and chill? My ideal date. I also don't love Cleopatra as a feminist icon because she was a literal monarch who enslaved people, hoarded wealth, and murdered anyone who got in the way of her pursuit of power. It's like when people are all girl power about Margaret Thatcher. She funded death squads, guys. Also, what if Thatcher and Reagan had banged? That's basically the kind of hell that this was. Could you imagine their decrepit skin slapping at each other? Like the sound that would make? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, holy shit, it's oh my word. Oh man. Oh, that's gross. But also, have you seen the Eric Andre bit? I have, yeah. Yeah, it's it fucking rules. It's like, uh, do you think she effectively utilized her girl power by funneling money into illegal paramilitary death squads in Northern Ireland? And then fucking, I think it was like Scary Spice or something. She's like, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, when I started researching the episode, I was like, oh, history is really mean to Cleopatra. That's really unfair. But then I started to think like, why do I care about defending Cleopatra? I mean, I do believe that in any instance of sexism, even if the person that it's targeted toward is someone I don't like, it doesn't make sexism okay. Like, we definitely have to interrogate the sexist narratives around Cleopatra, but we don't have to turn her into a feminist hero, is what I'm saying. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's the same kind of critique you get, like, you know, like, you can critique Hillary Clinton all you want, but the kind of people who are like, what if she gets her period and nukes everyone? That's sexy. Right. Also, because if if anyone is going to nuke anyone, it's going to be Hillary Clinton without her period because she's, you know, a war hawk. Yeah, and also because she's like 75 years old. (laughs) (laughs) That too. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just... I'm really uncomfortable with any form of dynastic feminism, and I'm pretty sure that's my term. So go ahead and use that in your graduate papers, people. Dynastic feminism. It sounds very... You should write a thesis to create the, create the term, like define the term. Oh, if you ever need ideas for your master's thesis or dissertation, I'm just a little idea mill when it comes to that kind of stuff. She I is, can, folks. Like, trust me. I talk to I her every day and she I can string a thesis out of anything. <laughs> She'll send me random thoughts that are like, you could possibly write 300 pages on them. Yeah, but I'm I'm just really uncomfortable examining women's history through the lens of the lives of aristocrats rather than working class women. Because remember, when Cleopatra was riding in on her gold-plated barge dressed as Aphrodite, regular Egyptian women were working the fields and sewing clothes and stuff like that. In their essay, Property Forms, Political Power, and Female Labor in the Origins of Class and State Societies, Stephanie Kuntz and Peter Henderson write, quote, The presence of such powerful women in ancient kinship-based aristocratic kingdoms or states should not be taken as evidence for an earlier matriarchal stage, however. It is perfectly compatible with a general devaluation of womanhood and may even depend upon this, end quote. We shouldn't ignore that Cleopatra was a woman of a particularly high class, just as we shouldn't ignore class in our discussions of gender today. Did Cleopatra face sexism from the Roman propagandists who hated to see a woman mucking up their plans for an expanded empire? Of course. But we still remember her name and know her as a queen, whereas I can't name a single regular Egyptian woman of that time or tell you any of their stories. This isn't to say that feminist scholars aren't working on building that history. Rosalind Miles's Who Cooked the Last Supper is a really great example. This also goes back to an ongoing discussion we have on this podcast about historiography. I think people want to feel connected to these powerful figures in history, and that's fine. But really, I know deep down that my ancestors from thousands of years ago until fairly recently were shoveling shit and dying in childbirth and worshiping cats. Cleopatra is fun to learn about for sure, but why do we even need a feminist analysis of her? She was literally part of a dynasty, probably as unrelatable as you can get. Okay, sorry, I just I just came up with a genius idea for an ad. Are you willing to listen to this ad idea? Yeah. 
It's the Last Supper. Jesus and his disciples are sitting around a table and they're they're waiting for their food. And, you know, I guess Jesus is like, you know, his mother or his girlfriend, whatever. They're trying to cook food, whatever, you know, like, like the usual sexist society of the time. But they bring the food and it doesn't taste so good. It's burnt, it's raw, whatever. And Jesus says, don't worry, I got it. And he whips out his iPhone and clicks on Uber Eats and orders food on Uber Eats, and an Uber Eats driver shows up, and Jesus goes to the door and picks up the food, and it's Uber Eats ad. You're going to hell. <laughs> Why? For blasphemy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's that's a hellish ad. <laughs> uh, but it, w- it, would, it would get sales. If, if anyone uses this ad, if, any, if like Uber Eats or Foodora end up using this ad, I expect royalties, by the way. This is, this is intellectual property now. It's blasphemous. It's sexist. Well, maybe that's it. Maybe it's like the Sabbath and they can't cook or something, but they can order in. I don't know. I don't fucking know, man. I, I just want I just want to make money. If they give me royalties for this ad, I'd, I'd live a happy life. Uh, but anyways, I know um, we were talking about this earlier about Game of Thrones uh, because I have watched the TV show and I've read the books. I don't know if you have watched it, Erin. I could not get into it. I'm sorry. I tried to watch it like three times and I always fell asleep. It's it's just not my type of thing. That's fair. That's fair. I the, the show makes a mess of the books. It really does. But I do agree with the comparison in general because ironically enough, Daenerys in the show Game of Thrones and the books, she's also a foreigner ruling a local population as a queen, but she's portrayed more as a sort of like foreign liberator who comes in and frees all the slaves and stuff. But it's funny because at the end of the day, she's still like, you know, queen. There's not like, you know, she's establishing a socialist people's republic or anything. And as you said, it begs a big question. Is it feminist to hoard wealth and exploit sort of mass peasantry and slaves while doing absolutely nothing of value? And No. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the short answer is really no. Oh, <laughs> was that a rhetorical question? <laughs> oh, no, I mean, yes. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> uh but yeah, it's also important not just to analyze history, but history historiography, um, which is like historiography. Yeah, historiography, that's the one. Historiography, uh, which is the making of history, not just in terms of like you know sexism endemic in it, but who can record their observations in a given time and place and why. Like for example, Egyptian peasant women were for the vast, vast, vast majority illiterate. Or even if by some miracle you find a literate Egyptian peasant, they certainly did not have the time and resources to compile a history of their experiences. Whereas Cleopatra, on the other hand, basically had an army of scribes and bureaucrats documenting her every act. So modern historians, if they're to analyze a particular society, all their sources are written by a particular class of people who monopolize the ability to you know, document things for most of human history. Yeah, relating to Cleopatra, we don't have that much written on her from her time and from the people around her, but it's likely that Octavian, who later became Augustus, destroyed those records because he did have this propaganda campaign going against Cleopatra and against Egypt in general to make imperialism okay. Like, that's always how it has worked. Yeah, he was very anti-Egypt. The original Orientalist. Pretty much. And yeah, to, I agree with you, to, for, because to me, citing Cleopatra as an example of girl power is kind of similar to how progressives may cite someone like Mansa Musa of the Empire of Mali as an example of like, you know, advanced African civilization. And apparently, from what I understand, Musa was considered the wealthiest man of the Middle Ages. And I get it to an extent. I used to follow the same trap where like, in order to counter claims of, you know, Arabs being barbarians or uncivilized, you go back to like the Abbasid Empire or the Umayyad Empire and like talk about, you know, some some dynasty or another. But from purely sort of Marxist perspective, I struggle to see how Middle Age Mali's uh, Jeff Bezos basically is a shining beacon of liberation, especially considering how his wealth probably came about on the backs of thousands of serfs and slaves. And, you know, you mentioned when Cleopatra went to Turkey to meet, Tarsus to meet uh, with Mark Anthony, she was on a barge decked with gold and she had a bunch of slaves around her uh, fanning her. 
And I don't know how the women slaves fanning her or the thousands of slaves that died mining the gold would feel about Cleopatra doing girl power. So to me, there's no difference between Cleopatra and, you know, modern day sort of see more, more women CEOs, more women uh, secretaries of state or whatever. Right. Yeah. And I feel like Cleopatra is an easy target because she died 2000 years ago. So who cares? You know, It doesn't. Yeah. There's all there, and there is you're right there is sexism there too. It's not like the criti- there there is valid critique and there is sexism the same way there is there is valid critiques of Marie Antoinette as a as a you know a royal figure but then a lot right. of a lot of the contemporary critiques in her time basically vilified her in a way to absolve uh, her husband Louis the Sixteenth by being like right. yeah Louis is nice but you know his evil bitch wife is ruining everything. Yeah, and actually when they brought her up on charges, she didn't deny charges that she was a hoarding aristocrat, but she did deny charges that she had abused her children and stuff like that because they launched these sexist attacks against her. And she's like, you know what? Sure, I'm rich and I had all this stuff while you guys are starving, but I didn't hit my kids. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting how like, you know, there's like, yeah, you can critique a royal... Uh, person for being royal but for being a woman and creating all these sexist allegations a whole other thing altogether on that great and happy note i guess yeah um we hope that you liked our episode on cleopatra maybe learn some interesting things next week we're gonna take you to church with another ancient true crime story that of the execution of jesus of nazareth yeah, the real the real life Jesus who apparently existed and is a cool guy. No, he definitely existed. Yeah, and he definitely ordered from Uber Eats. So we want to give a shout out to one of our new Patreons. Hello, Jamie. Thanks for subscribing. Jamie is our friend. Yeah, hi, Jamie. If you want to subscribe to our Patreon page for bonus content and your own shout out, you can do so. The link is always in the description. Also, thanks to friend of the pod and personal friend Mysam for sending me a bumblebee because I say on the pod frequently that I like bees and our friend Mysam sent me a bee in the mail. Yeah, to clarify. <laughs> a stuffed it's a, bee. Yeah, I, mean, I wanted to be like, to clarify, it's not a real live bee. That's it. <laughs> and, I've named, <laughs> and I've named it Habibi. You can follow us on Instagram at DustCriminalPod. And also, please leave us a review on your podcast provider if you can do so, because it really helps the pod gain visibility. Yeah, thanks, everyone. We really appreciate your support, your listening, um, and your un- undivided, unbroken loyalty to us as your pharaohs for life. Yeah, <laughs> we do appreciate it. You guys can't, of course, see it from where you are, but we can see that the pod is slowly but surely growing. And It's just so exciting for us. We work really hard on it and we can see it kind of branching out in certain areas like you guys are telling your friends and we just appreciate that so, so, so much. Yeah, thanks everyone. Appreciate it. So we will see you guys next week with some Jesus material. Yeah, bye everyone. Bye. Bye.